Right now it is 9:10 a.m. We are going to Berkeley by a van. Adrian is driving this car. Right now we are at the Berkeley National Lab bus station and we are waiting to get on the bus and go to the lab. <laughs> They're packaged for us. You guys get stuck. All right, so I know you guys are part of the Santa Cruz Chemistry Club. Tell me more about that. Okay, so what are the so you say it's a chemistry club? The majority of us are chemistry majors, but we also accept all people from all majors. We're just all students who are interested in chemistry, who have taken chemistry classes, or never taken one, just like hanging out with us. So, so I'll explain what I do here. My name is Cindy Lee, and I am a communications specialist here at the Advanced Light Source. So what that means is when the scientists have some cool results, we want to help them share. Where are we? Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Yes, and this is Lawrence. Ernest O. Lawrence. Yeah, so this has some cool history here. Um, it was a former employee of the lab who uh, painted this, and so at some point it came to the ALS and we were able to put it here. Uh, what do you, Does anyone know what he's holding in his hand? Unfortunately, it is neither a turtle nor a flask. That was his four inch slick electron. 16 elements were discovered here. Um, obviously, a lot of his work was instrumental in that. And with the cyclotron, uh, you know, the way it worked was you needed these powerful magnets to accelerate the particles. And he decided that the four inch probably wasn't powerful enough. So he increased to like an 11 inch and then he was like, well, let's build it out. So at some point, the townspeople of Berkeley got very nervous. So at some point, the townspeople of Berkeley said, Lawrence, we're really freaked out that you're doing this crazy science stuff in Berkeley, so you can't do it on campus anymore. You need to go up the hill. So that's why he came up the hill. So as you came in, you saw that this building has this big round dome, right? So you can see the skeleton of that in this historical photo here. Okay, uh, so you guys are chemists? We're chemists. Yes. I'm a chemist. All right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> okay, so you guys do, you, do, you to, do you want me to take them all? Uh, no, we well, probably okay, okay, to, to make just, a little Just in case you... Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, cyclotron. This, so Lawrence uh, got the Nobel Prize for developing the cyclotron. He got the Nobel Prize in 1939, but he, he came across country in 1928 from Yale. He grew up in South Dakota. He gets here, and a friend tells him, think about accelerating nucleus. But he's not going to do that. He's doing the photoelectric thing. Well, he's read, in, the, in the library down on campus, he's reading this German article, but he doesn't read German, but he looks at it, and he says, oh, I know how to make the cyclotron. This is model 2.0 of the cyclotron. The first one was four and a half inches, then 11 inches, then 27 inches, and 37 inches, and 60 inches. So what happens is they just discovered radioactivity, you know, about 10 years earlier, and he wants to, he wants to measure radioactivity. So he has a scintillation tube, but he needs a window. And so he does, he's getting strange results, so he says, I'm going to take, I'm going to make a window. And he uses gold because gold is malleable. You can get it one atom thick. So he shoots alpha, Geiger shoots alpha particles through it, and 99% of those alpha particles, this is, this is first quarter freshman chemistry, right? Uh, okay. And so 99% of the alpha particle, particles go straight through. 1% gets scattered. Rutherford walks by the ring and he says, stick the detector on this side, and a few alpha particles hit the bounce back. And what happens is, in, he published his work in 1911, but in 1910, the model of the atom was the plum pudding model by J.J. Thompson. There are protons and electrons, they didn't know about neutrons, and there's, there's really no structure. And so he looks at it and he goes, no, all the protons are in the, the, uh, the nucleus, the electrons are going around. Most of the atom is empty space, so the alpha, alpha particles are going straight through. When the plus two alpha particle gets close to the plus seven nine gold, it veers off because it's Coulombic interruption. When it gets a head-on collision, it goes back the way it came. So what happens is he, he gets the structure of the atom, the size of the atom. Awesome, in 1911, all right? And what he does is, when you have the alpha particle coming up, he says, if I can accelerate this, because it, and re repulsion forces, the Coulomb force is repulsion, if I can overcome that with some speed, some energy, then, that, then it, I can 
fragment that, I can see what's inside the movement. So what happens is that's 19, 1911. In 1919, Rutherford publishes another paper where I only figured out this out when I got here 10 years ago, is that he took alpha particles and he hit nitrogen and he changed uh, uh, nitrogen into oxygen. He did the first transmutation. And so Lawrence gets here and the, fr the friend coming across the country says, you know, accelerate nuclei. He sees the article in the German, uh, the, the, uh, the diagram in the German paper, and he says, this is it. And so all it is is the 11 inch brass disc. You put the top on, you use a vacuum pump to suck all the air out. You put it between a large magnetic field, okay? You, put, you bleed in through that line there, you bleed in hydrogen, okay? But you ionize it. When you take the electrons away from hydrogen gas, you get protons. So you have protons just sitting there. How would you accelerate them? This is an electrode. I mean, there, this D is an electrode. There's another D on this side. You make it plus and minus. The proton's gonna go, to, go toward the minus. You heard of the right-hand rule? Mm -hmm. Well, this is the left-hand rule, because that's how, what proton, I mean, so it's gonna be this one. And so the protons are gonna curve in a magnetic field. As it gets to this electrode, you switch the field. Now minus over here and plus. So every half time it goes around, you switch the field, and what it does is it gives it a little push. So it's gonna go out and go out and get faster and faster and faster and do bigger, bigger circuits. So what you've done is the four and a half inch, inch one was, does it work? And then so the rest of the ones is, can you get more tight, uh, stronger magnets to make tighter curls in a bigger disc to get more energy? So what were the two, two types of experiments they wanted to do? Basically, you take the 60 inch cyclotron, which is the atoll, right? That was down on campus, nothing was up here. And you take a proton, you spin it around, and you have it come out the window here, and now you have it hit a foil. And now when you get the nuclear nuclear collisions, you have photographic film as, as your detector in a magnetic field. So if a fragmented piece goes straight, that meant it was neutral. If it was positive, it went left, it was negative, it went right. So now you can run things into each other and see what the building blocks are matter with. And so in order to tune that, you're gonna have to try your protocol over and over to optimize that brightness. And so the way to do it faster is using robots. So if you can kind of see through this window, uh, you can see the back of a giant glove chamber. The glove chamber is about hmm, 15 feet long or so, and that houses our robot named Herman. So Herman, uh, you can do 96 different recipes at the same time. He can pipette liquids, he can aliquot out solids, he can mix them, and very soon he'll be able to heat the different wells to different temperatures. All right, so these two okay. gray things that I am pointing at are peptoid synthesis robots. The bottles with the yellow labels are where you put your individual starting materials or the starting beads, and then you put the recipe into the computer. Uh, it will pump those one at a time up to the reaction vessels at the top where it will uh, use a plastic bead as a substrate. And then one at a time, you just add the chemicals that react, and then they get, you get a chain that's longer and longer. Once you're done, you do a reaction to cleave uh, the peptoid off the bead, and then you have them in solution. So this picture, best in the world in 2009. Now you can see silicon, nitrogen, and silicon and nitrogen, and silicon, nitrogen. This is called an oxygen doped sample, which means they jammed oxygen atoms on purpose into the vacancies in the crystal lattice. You can measure the distance between these atoms to within half an angstrom, which is the radius of a hydrogen. Um, so this was best in the world in 2009, and essentially still is today. Any questions? People realize what you're looking at. Like, this is proof that we have not been bullshitting you through the nature. <laughs> Those actually exist, and that what they look like. That means, uh, take take a moment and a breath to realize how remarkable this is. How mind-boggling.